and now moving uh, to Professor Karim Abdatawab, uh, one of the eminent professors in the uh, radiology and radiological intervention. Uh, I believe he is um, coming uh, lately to Egypt. Thank you for having you with us, uh, Dr. Karim, and please uh, start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear doctor, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure being here. Um, I'm currently, uh, can you see now my uh, presentation? Yes, it's okay. Okay, okay. thank you very much. I will be talking about intervention radiology in pediatric ICU, and um, it has been a long-term collaboration between uh, ASIN and Champs University, between the intervention radiology unit and the radiology department, and... Um, Okay, just one. okay. Uh, between the intervention radiology unit in Anchams University and the pediatric department, and now we uh, almost do maybe uh, five to ten cases per day. So um, it's a great collaboration, actually. Uh, the pediatric ICU is a very special place in every hospital, and the intervention radiology scope of practice overlaps with many other specialities in the ICU, providing unique opportunities for uh, our collaboration together. Uh, the pediatric intervention radiology has markedly flourished over the past decade due to the increasing uh, development of imaging equipment with the smaller devices and technical innovations uh, leading to better care uh, specific for uh, the smallest patients. So how can we as intervention radiologists help you? Uh, I'm be, uh, I will be talking about four uh, entities. Of course, there are so many entities, but these are the critical care uh, entities, which are the feeding tubes, the tapping and drainage tube placements, the venous access placement, and the uh, vascular uh, embolization. So about the feeding tubes. Um, as we all know, enteral nutrition is always preferred to total uh, parenteral nutrition to provide uh, feeding in various clinical settings in the pediatric ICU. It is less expensive, it is safer, it maintains nutritional, metabolic, immunological barrier functions of the intestines. We have two types of enteral nutrition, the pre-pyloric and the post-pyloric. Um, the pre-pyloric is the gastric feeding and the post-pyloric is for patients with intractable vomiting, for example, where we need to put uh, jejunal uh, feeding tubes. Uh, each one of the two types have two uh, subtypes, the short-term feeding tubes, the nasogastric tube and the nasojejunal tubes, and the long-term feeding tubes, which are the gastrostomy or the jejunostomy tubes. Here is the rile or the nasogastric tube. Um, it has the disadvantages of being inconvenient to the child if the child is conscious, a high risk of aspiration, nasal and oropharyngeal infections. Also, it is short-term and the infections increase when we put it for a long time. So is there a role for interventional radiology? Uh, uh, mostly not actually, but I've been asked many times, especially in patients with uh, um, stenosis or, uh, or esophageal stenosis and such stuff to put, uh, it is safer to put uh, the rile under uh, fluoroscopic guidance, but actually this is not always the case. Those are uh, rare cases, but we might have a role. However, in gastrostomy tubes, uh, patients with uh, neurological dysphagia, like those with CP, amyotrophic sclerosis, um, those with markedly underweight and malnourished might uh, totally benefit from a gastrostomy tube to inject food uh, through. It is percutaneous, it's a very small opening and needs much less time to place compared to surgical and endoscopic gastrostomy. And we actually have two uh, types of gastrostomy tubes, the pull technique or the retained gastrostomy tubes and the uh, push technique gastrostomy uh, tubes. These are the types of the pull technique. The pull technique depends on having a mushroom head, what we call the mushroom head, and we pull it through the patient's mouth to be um, uh, fixed uh, through uh, the skin to come out uh, from uh, the skin. It has so many advantages. It is much more durable. It might remain for more than a year, and it is self-retained. It doesn't need anything to uh, fix it to... Uh, the stomach or to fix it to the anterior abdominal wall. However, um, the proper kits are not always available in the market for, I'm talking about children, they are always available for adults, but we are talking about uh, for adults, it's a 24 French uh, catheter and children we need 12 or 14 uh, sometimes or yeah, many times they are not uh, that available and it is much more difficult to apply, especially in younger children when we are having an innate or something, sometimes it's very difficult and it might be more uh, injurious and having more aspiration and infection. And uh, more importantly, the patient should be moved. It needs fluoroscopy. You cannot do this by ultrasound alone. As uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Shaima just said, ultrasound is a bad side. So anything that can be done by ultrasound alone, it's a, a bonus for us or a benefit for us. Uh, do you, uh, so um, here, uh, this needs uh, fluoroscopy. 
here uh, is uh, some technical steps. This is a very interesting technique. We fill the stomach with air, and then we go through the uh, rhizodormia basket. That was a 15-year-old uh, child or adolescent, we can say. Then we go with an angiocas through from the skin percutaneously through the dormia basket. And then we put a Biffet guide wire, a specified Biffet guide wire. Then we get the guide wire uh, out of the uh, make a knot and then pull uh, the knot um, pulled again through the patient's nose or mouth to be retained by uh, the stomach. And then we inject contrast medium to ensure uh, the place in uh, the stomach. Uh, we also have the push technique uh, gastrostomy tubes. The push techniques has mainly two main uh, entities, the balloon tubes and the uh, pigtail tubes. This is the balloon tube. You can see it is retained by a balloon, and this is retained by a pigtail uh, catheter. It is less injurious and, e uh, and easier to uh, apply. However, also the kits are not usually available for children. It is less durable and more liable to slippage, and it is not self-retaining, so better we can use something that's called a T-fastener for uh, application, which is an extra uh, cost and also needs fluoroscopy, so we cannot do uh, this solely in the uh, pediatric ICU. We have to move uh, the patient to the intervention radiology unit. Here we can see this is a balloon catheter. This is a stomach and this is a balloon. And this is a pigtail uh, catheter to inject uh, food uh, through a gastrostomy. So about the post-pyloric feeding, it's for patients with intractable vomiting induced by bone marrow transplantation, patients on chemotherapy, uh, patients of deep coma for any reason necessitating long-term uh, feeding for the fear of aspiration, we might benefit from this. Um, if it is needed for a very short period of time, we should opt for an isojusional tube. This is an isojusional tube. It's exactly like the... Um, nasogastric tube, the rail, but it has uh, some um, like um, small uh, metal balls in uh, the end to help to go through. And here we can see uh, the, uh, 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 we can inject through a contrast medium through the uh, nasojusional tube and it's all in the jejunum. Nothing is going back to the stomach. Here is the um, gas of uh, the stomach and here is the uh, jejunum. Here is another uh, picture for the same uh, nasal jejunal uh, tubes. If post pyloric feeding is needed for a long period of time, we should go for a uh, jejunostomy. And here is the image of the jejunostomy. This is a balloon jejunostomy. We put the balloon here. And as you can see, the characteristic feathery appearance of uh, the jejunum. This is a combined ultrasound guidance and fluoroscopic uh, guidance. So what are the contraindications for enteral nutrition? We cannot do this for patients with complete bowel obstruction, severe malabsorption, inability to access the gut, like severe burns, high loss, uh, intestinal uh, fissure. Uh, that was for the feeding tubes. My second entity today is a tapping and drainage tube uh, placement. Uh, ascites and pleural effusion are very common medical problems that can be seen in the PICU. Uh, the pleural uh, infections have become more prevalent currently with more uh, pediatric cases uh, being seen. And um, um, I, I believe maybe my dear colleague, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Ahmed Riz, we have seen many patients that died the last year. There were, has been many patients who has developed severe pleural uh, effusion and it was very purulent effusion. Uh, all of a sudden, within a few days, and the patient uh, died. Uh, there are three stages for pleural uh, effusion, the exodative stage, the fibroperulent stage, and the organizational stage. Uh, stage one is where accumulation of clear fluid, which is the best case scenario when the patient presents with this uh, type, as Dr. Shaima said, and we can go and tap this uh, usually very easily or uh, put a pigtail. Stage two is the starting of septations and loculations with increase of white blood cells, and Step three is the chronic empyema with marked septations. And I, I can see maybe my, uh, my dear professors in, in pediatrics can tell us, but I've seen many cases that developed this uh, stage, uh, organizational stage within a few days. So um, maybe we can, we can discuss this, but uh, this, this has been seen a lot uh, last year and this year as well in the uh, winter. So the decision making, I'm talking about the decision whether we should put a pigtail If it is localized or diffuse. Um, if it is localized and it is small, we can just go and aspirate it and inject the antibiotic and that's it. If it is diffuse, sometimes it's better to put a big tail. Sometimes we need to do repeated tappings. 
uh, the amount can it be drained from one session or not the turbidity in pyema or hematoma we must put a pigtail to avoid recurrence um the plural tapping we have the drainage devices like the uh, abocas or the angiocas and the uh, cannula here uh, we can see this is an image and this is our um, we can see the uh, abocas. Here is the tip of our angiocast, and this is the collapsed lung. Um, the, if you have a large abscess, large collection, recurrent tapping, we need a drainage device, which is a pigtail catheter. This is the shape of uh, the pigtail. And here we can see uh, the pigtail within the uh, pleural uh, cavity. Uh, do we have a role in pneumothorax? Um, Yes, we might have a role in pneumothorax, especially in neonates and very small children. Uh, we can put a pigtail guided by fluoroscopy, uh, as we will see in the uh, next example here. I'm sorry, the images are not very good, but this was a uh, weak CR machine. But here we are having a pigtail. This we can see the pneumothorax and here the pigtail. And uh, we can put the pigtail underwater seal exactly like the um, uh, chest tube, but it is rather less injurious than the chest tube. Um, ascites, uh, we uh, uh, no, you will not talk much about ascites. We have uh, so many uh, causes of ascites, the most important of which are hepatic, renal, and cardiac, like congestive heart failure and pericarditis. And here we can see it's very easily, we can uh, just go and tap the ascites. This is uh, an everyday uh, practice. Um, the third thing I'm going to talk about is the venous access placement, which is uh, actually the most important entity of my talk today. We do this every day. My residents do about from five, as I told you, from five to ten uh, pediatric cases per day for a, a simple venous access. And we do in the unit the advanced venous access, maybe five to ten per week. So um, establishing and maintaining reliable access is the top priority in almost all patients in the pediatric ICU. Early access planning prevents IV-related complications and negative outcomes for patients and the hospital. The choice of which uh, venous access device to use is a uh, collaborative process. Um, uh, infusion therapies play a major role in the treatment um, plan for almost every uh, disease process in the uh, pediatric ICU. We have two types mainly of uh, venous access devices, peripheral and uh, central. Um, the peripheral is appropriate device for a short-term therapy like the cannula, uh, less than five days, and the central uh, medications in very high or very low pH or high osmolarity, uh, ordered medications or fluid, uh, are known irritants to the veins, uh, the ionotropes, the vesicants, etc. So the choice depends on uh, duration of therapy, characteristics of the injections, available insertion sites, existing co uh, morbidities. Uh, as for the peripheral venous access device, we, it's usually placed uh, blindly by the nurses or the uh, pediatricians. So is there a role for uh, ultrasound here? Uh, honestly, yes, uh, there is. Blind access is usually done with little uh, to no difficulty. However, um, access may become more difficult in patients with uh, marked uh, edema. Um, in these particular cases, ultrasound can increase the success rate of cannulation according to the most studies in children from 33 uh, to 50% in blind cannulation up to 70 to 80%. And here we can see there is here marked edema uh, over the anticubital vein, and this is the artery, and here is the cannula going through the vein, the cannula going through uh, the vein itself guided by uh, ultrasound. I don't recommend this for very young neonates, it usually fails. And I don't recommend this for patients with uh, total dehydration that have collapsed veins. Um, but I recommend this for patients with um, complications. The peripheral access complications have a similar complication rates to the blind approach. The secret of low complication rates is improving first attempt success. And the lower number of punctures, the less complications uh, might happen. Complications are usually simple, like hematoma, thrombosis, sunflebitis, cellulitis, and uh, extravasation. So about the central venous uh, access devices, they are used in children needing a venous access for a relatively long period uh, of time, or with drugs with very high or uh, very low uh, pH and uh, with uh, high uh, osmolarity. They are indicated for hemodynamic monitoring, the administration of hyperosmolar agents, hemodialysis, and plasmapheresis, and the lack of 
peripheral uh, axis. So we have actually two types of central venous access devices, the tunneled and the non-tunneled. There is a third type, which is the implanted, which is the port case, but it's not, um, we, we are not talking about it in uh, this particular um, presentation because it's not for a, uh, an ICU patient. The non-tunneled catheter, it's like, it's like the central line and the mahukar. It is direct venipuncture through the skin to the selected vein, peripherally inserted central catheters and percutaneous uh, central catheters. Uh, the uh, peripherally inserted, which are the peak lines, peripherally inserted central catheters, we put it through the uh, hand of the child, the, the arm, and we go, uh, the tip of it comes to, to the uh, superior vena cava, and the central uh, cath venous catheters are inserted at or above the anticubital space, and then advanced until the distal tip of the catheter uh, is positioned at the superior vena cava or superior uh, vena cava and right atrial uh, junction. This is the peak line. And the non tunnel percutaneous uh, central venous access devices, we have uh, the central venous catheters, or the known for everybody as the central line or the center. Uh, we use the internal jugular subclavian or femoral single, double, or triple uh, lumen. This is the uh, central line. Um, large vessels are easily visualized with ultrasound, no matter the size of the baby. Differentiate arteries from veins. Veins are non-pulsatile and uh, compressible. Here we can see this is a, a single lumen uh, central line, as we can see within the uh, internal jugular vein. And we have the mahukar when we need to have a high flow uh, injections or to do hemodialysis. And here we can see the mahukar. We can see it is much wider compared the central line is only from here to here, and the mahukar has a much wider uh, diameter, as we can see here. Uh, as for the complications, uh, these complications are usual, especially when we are doing a huge number of cases that what we do. Um, there are immediate, like the pseudoaneurysm, the malposition, the hematomas, the uh, arrhythmias. Nemo or hemothorax are not very common, thanks God. And the distance, uh, like the nemo or hemothorax, which are Usually, uh, this doesn't happen. It's very rare. Uh, arrhythmias, it's common skin infections and bacteremia, uh, and stenosis or thrombosis of uh, vessels. Um, the question here is, is this a bedside that we should always do with, as I showed, with uh, ultrasound only, or we uh, need to have fluoroscopy? Uh, I believe as much as possible, we need to have uh, fluoroscopy. Uh, this is my. This might not be always applicable in the pediatric ICU. However, if we can do this, we should do uh, do it under combined ultrasound and fluoroscopic guidance. Why? Because of this, we can see here. I had a video for this, but I have a, a rather slow connection because it's uh, too late at night. Um, here we have this is a blind uh, application. Uh, this was not done in our department, but it came to us. Uh, that uh, was a 12-year-old child. Um, we have it, it's coming from the right internal jugular and it went to the other side to the left uh, subclavian. So we simply just removed it and uh, put uh, a, uh, as we can see, a wire and we applied it uh, safely. Um, so I believe we should, if we can have uh, the patient to be done under fluoroscopic guidance, it's much better. The tunnel CVC or the permicast. Uh, it is tunneled under the skin uh, to the vein of the neck or uh, chest and the cuff near the exit site anchors the catheter in place and it is used for uh, long-term uh, hemodialysis. Here is the uh, Dacron tip as we can see. The technique we should always here combine uh, x-ray with uh, ultrasound. This is a must. Why? To avoid this, uh, honestly, these are not uh, children, but I have seen this in children. This is ephemeral, blind. It was not done in the radiology department at all. It was done in another department. And here we can see it was blind, not under fluoroscopic guidance. So there is a complete kink of the tip of the catheter, and you can never tell this by ultrasound alone. And here is from the internal jugular. And here, after we uh, corrected the positioning of uh, the uh, catheters, we can see here uh, after catheter correction. So what if all accessible uh, veins are uh, thrombosed? Um, this happens a lot in end-stage renal disease with uh, long-term uh, hemodialysis. Um, 
so uh, uh, we do a transhepatic tunnel catheter. And actually, we did uh, lots of these. I've done in both pediatrics and adults uh, more than up, to, up till now. It's 400 cases. And I have a, an accepted poster uh, on my first 300 cases. And you will be surprised that um, I did about 30 cases in the past few months for uh, that were referred from Abu Rish by Dr. Um, Fatina Fadel. Um, here we just go by ultrasound and we need fluoroscopy here. This is the hepatic vein, the right hepatic vein, and this is introduction of the wire. And then we apply the uh, permicase directly to the uh, right atrium through the hepatic vein. It's a very uh, easy, very durable um, procedure. And I published it, uh, it was not published, but it was accepted as a poster before in uh, the pairs. Uh, so, here we can have something that's interesting. I do not recommend this all the time, but it's a very interesting topic. What if the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava are both thrombosed, totally uh, thrombosed? Here we can see this patient, all of these are abnormal vessels uh, due to superior vena cava thrombosis, and he had inferior vena cava thrombosis. So uh, that was a patient. Uh, they refused. Uh, the vascular surgeons uh, told, that, um, told us that uh, doing a, an arterio arterial anastomosis for dialysis is not um, applicable in this patient. So I discussed it with my uh, very dear colleague and my dear friend, Dr. Dina Brahim, and we decided to try something new after consenting the father to put it in the um, portal uh, vein. And here is the portal vein, and the catheter is seen in uh, the portal vein. And here is the catheter in the portal vein to the superior uh, mesenteric vein, as we can see. And the patient could actually uh, had um, adequate hemodialysis for uh, four months before he died after this from uh, sepsis. That was the catheter. And we published this in the Arab Journal as a case report with uh, my dear uh, friend, Dr. Dina Ibrahim. Um, it was published as a case report, that, and it was cited more than 100 times. Uh, sorry, it, was, um, it had more than 100 views and it was cited five or six uh, times because that was the first time to attempt this kind of technique in uh, the history. Nobody has ever uh, attempted to do uh, this. Um, my last topic is the vascular embolization. I will not talk much because it's not very common in children. I'm originally an embolizer. I do embolization all the time for adults. You can use it in GIT bleeding, in renal bleeding, but the uh, commonest setting for uh, children, it's not as common as a solid indication uh, as in adults, but the causes of bleeding are usually atrogenic like the example I'm going to show now, which is a post-renal biopsy hematuria for a pelvic uh, kidney. Here we can see this is a warta that was a four-year-old child. It was done under general anesthesia. And this is, as you can see, the renal artery. It's a pelvic kidney. The renal artery should be here. And it was a uh, pelvic kidney. And here we can see it is totally malrotated. The, mal the kidney is totally malrotated upside down. This is an accessory renal artery with an AV fistula. Here we can see the IVC. And here we can see the renal artery. We very simply embolized this with embolization particles. And at the same time, we preserved the uh, original, not the accessory renal artery, and the patient went uh, amazingly. Um, now, please um, allow me to, um, because I, I, I believe Dr. it's, um, Sorry, I can't uh, hear it's you. very important to uh, give a tribute to my uh, dear uh, residents, my uh, heroes, because um, honestly, they do all the work. I, uh, of course, these are my cases, but they do um, thousands of cases uh, every year. Uh, they have very great collaboration. So I have to upload them and say uh, thank you for everybody for uh, uh, making uh, this collaboration uh, possible. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Dr. Karim Abdetawe, for your uh, nice Thank and you, elegant... Professor Dr. Karim, for uh, a really, I can't hear uh, interesting and comprehensive uh, talk. You almost answered uh, so many questions received in the Q&A box. And now we're moving to Professor Dr. Sarwat, 